Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. We'll get started in a few minutes. Um, hang tight. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I, I think it's time to get started. Uh, we're going to go ahead and begin the recording. Um, again, thank you for joining. My name is Karen Richardson, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Association of Women Lawyers. I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's webinar. The ERA has gained fresh momentum after... 47 years as Virginia is poised to become the 38th and final state to ratify the ERA. Ratification is complicated by questions about the applicability of congressional deadlines and the fact that other states have rescinded ratification in the intervening years. Our amazing speakers today will discuss these issues as well as provide a little history and discuss why the Equal Rights Amendment is still so necessary today. Our speakers are Jessica Newworth, co-founder and co-president of the ERA Coalition and the Fund for Women's Equality, as well as Linda Coberly, managing partner of Winston and Strong Chicago office and chair of the ERA Coalition's Legal Task Force. I could spend the full hour telling you about the amazing accomplishments of our speakers today, but I'm going to restrain myself so we can get to the topic at hand, the Equal Rights Amendment. Linda, you want to get us started? I'd be happy to. Um, thank you so much, Karen. It is really a pleasure to be talking with all of you today. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking with some of you, I imagine, at the General Counsel Institute uh, that Nall hosted in uh, November. And that's really what led to this webinar. Um, we spoke a little bit at one of the panels about uh, about the Equal Rights Amendment, along with um, my firm's work for the women's soccer team in their equal pay case, and uh, had what I, I'm happy to say is a common experience, which is when a group of women hear about the Equal Rights Amendment, they are excited by it and surprised sometimes and curious about the uh, legal issues and the difficulties of ratifying um, and some of the issues that are presented under Article 5 of the Constitution. So um, we are really pleased to be able to talk with you today. Um, what you see on your screen is the is a pin that some of you may remember um, yourselves wearing and some of you may remember your mothers wearing um, in the 70s. And an awful lot of people think that the Equal Rights Amendment was just something that happened in the 70s, kind of as a historical artifact. Um, a surprising number of people, including lawyers, think it was actually put in the Constitution. Uh, so we're going to start with that history and talk about um, what the Equal Rights Amendment is and how we got to today. And then we'll also end our program talking about um, some of the implications potentially of an Equal Rights Amendment, why we still need it, and uh, some of the ratification issues um, that we are all certain to hear more about in the next uh, year um, as, the, as the fight heats up. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Jessica to talk about what the ERA is. Great. Well, thank you uh, to Nall uh, for organizing this and, and inviting me and to all of you for being here. This is, I think, so important, unfinished business. And uh, I would just start quickly at the beginning, which is the Constitution itself. And as many of us will know or remember uh, from history, women were left out of the Constitution despite the intentionally, despite the impassioned plea of Abigail Adams to her husband to remember the ladies. But that did not happen. And so from the beginning, there has been uh, this omission um, that I think is long overdue for correction. Uh, and there's been an ongoing effort since those early days to initially get women the right to vote, which finally happened with the 19th Amendment. And I think there's a slide that gives you the 19th Amendment. Um, and that was ratified in 1920. And Shortly thereafter, uh, Alice Paul, I believe you have a really nice picture of Alice Paul in this, yeah. Um, Alice Paul, who was one of the key activists who worked for the 19th Amendment tirelessly, as soon as it was passed, turned her attention and others also who had worked on suffrage to get all the other rights into the Constitution. And that's where the Equal Rights Amendment was born. She was one of the principal drafters of it. And, excuse me, it was first introduced into Congress in 1923. And there was a long history of efforts to build support uh, for the ERA, but it wasn't uh, actually passed until 1972. And in 1972, I think we have the language that was finally passed. Uh, did we miss it? Okay, yeah. Wait, sorry. So anyway, the language which I think we zip by was uh, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Um, that wasn't exactly how Alice Paul drafted it, but that's how it ended up in 1972. It was ratified, uh, I mean, passed by two thirds of uh, each house of Congress, which is how Article 5 governs amendments. Um, that's the resolution. And uh, then it was sent to the states for ratification and three quarters of the states, which is now 38 states, have to ratify the amendment before it goes into the Constitution. And immediately, once it was passed in 1972, there was like a rush to ratify. And the first state to ratify the ERA was Hawaii, which did so in, within one hour of its passage. And there was, I think, 22 states in the first year that ratified the ERA. So it just seemed like it was on a steamroll to uh, enter the Constitution. Um, but then, I guess, and people were marching for it and lobbying for it, really right in the middle of the rise of the sort of women's consciousness movement that, that led to, to where we are today. Um, so all of this effort was moving forward uh, without too much or any opposition. Um, and suddenly, or relatively suddenly, came to a halt uh, in the mid-70s. Um, when Phyllis Schlafly and others started the Stop ERA movement. And there's a lot of speculation about her motivation and whether it was insurance industry interests or business interests. But in any event, she, uh, I think to many of the act advocates whom I've talked to at the, from, from those times felt that it was unexpected. So they weren't really ready for this backlash. And she, um, created a lot of uh, sort of women against women in the media. And even though I don't believe she really represented anything close to a majority, just having that dissident voice really stopped the ERA uh, ratification in its tracks. And in 1978, just before the deadline, which was originally seven years, um, was going to expire, uh, Liz Holtzman uh, led an effort in Congress to extend the deadline to 1982. And during that time, at that point, 35 states had ratified. Uh, there were not any additional states that ratified, but efforts continued literally to the last moment. And um, many people say that it was just a handful of votes in a few states that, uh, that kept uh, the ERA from being ratified by the 1982 deadline. Um, now the 1982, I'm just, uh, sorry. 
1982 deadline, I think, basically took it um, took this off the uh, off the agenda in in the 1970s, and people turned to the 14th Amendment. And um, there's a map. I apologize that I'm not looking at my screen. Yeah. So there's a map of who ratified and who didn't ratify. Uh, and these two swaths uh, um, are the states that we're focusing on today. Um, did you want me to turn it back to you, Linda, at this point? Or? Yes. I, so I can take it from here for a little bit. So this map, it reflects where things sat for a very long time um, with <clears throat> um, you can see a, a handful of states in the West, um, not coincidentally states that have a heavy influence from the Church of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church, um, are, were unratified, uh, Utah, Nevada, and Arizona. And then you have states in the Southeast and then heading up into the Midwest with Missouri and Illinois. Um, these were the unratified states for, for a very long time. So then what happened? Well, the it, things didn't end. Um, we, we think it ended because the effort um, receded from uh, kind of the public consciousness and it was no longer as big a news story as it was in the 1970s and 80s. But efforts to ratify an Equal Rights Amendment continued. Um, for one thing, a, um, a new Equal Rights Amendment, a new start over bill, was introduced in Congress every single year started, starting in 1982. Um, most recently for the last, I don't know, maybe 15, 17 years or something like that, it was introduced by Carolyn Maloney, representative from New York, um, who introduced a, a start over bill and a, a really an effort to, um, to begin the process again um, and, uh, and, and add a, an amendment to the, to the Constitution with somewhat different language. It was more explicitly about women um, and would have um, started the process anew. Um, there were also a lot of efforts to pass equal rights amendments in the states. And um, those efforts um, happened on a, on a lot of fronts. They were uh, local grassroots efforts. There were national efforts, including efforts that Jessica spearheaded um, to to get equal rights amendments into state constitutions. And at this point, I believe it's about half of the states or maybe a little over half do have state equal rights amendments in them. Interestingly, my home state, Illinois, had an equal rights amendment in its constitution dating back to 1980, um, but did not ratify the federal ERA um, uh, when it had the opportunity in the early 80s. And in fact, um, a lot of people think that Illinois is kind of where the ERA went to die in the early 80s uh, because it really became uh, a kind of focal point for Phyllis Schlafly and the opposition effort and was a very um, divisive topic in Springfield, our state capital, um, with uh, advocates and opponents, you know, chained to the doors of the state Senate and, you know, pig blood being spilled on the um uh, on the marble. It was a very dramatic time and a very hotly fought fight. And ultimately, Illinois did not ratify in the early 1980s. Um, but, but, but again, the efforts continued in Illinois and in other states and then really took a turn in 19, uh, or sorry, in 2017 when uh, the state of Nevada ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, this was not uh, it seemed like it was out of the blue. It may seem to some of us like it was out of the blue, but it really wasn't. Um, there had been a, a kind of new strategy that evolved uh, over the last 10 years or so um, called the three-state strategy, which, and the idea behind that was that instead of starting over, what if we just finished the ratification of uh, the Equal Rights Amendment that was passed by Congress in 1972? And um, it was that strategy that pushed uh, that got pushed forward in the state of Nevada and was ultimately led by a fantastic state senator named Pat Spearman, um, who is a, a terrific advocate and um, uh, a member of the clergy, a veteran, a member of the LGBTQ community. She's a fantastic speaker and um, very passionate about this subject. And she really led the charge in Nevada and Nevada ratified in the spring of 2017. Um, at that point, efforts in Illinois really heated up, and that's when um, I got involved. Um, uh, the slide, if you go back one slide, um, Isabel, the, um, 
there's a photograph of, of people in the office of my law firm in Chicago. Um, we, we got some people together who were working um, separately in different grassroots efforts to push for ratification in Illinois and help them kind of organize themselves. They've been involved in this project much longer than we had at my law firm. Um, but we, uh, we joined the effort and helped provide some uh, legal support. And ultimately, I was really thrilled when Illinois ratified in the spring of 2018, becoming the 37th state to ratify. And so that's where we are today. And we have a map um, uh, showing the two new ratifications, Nevada and Illinois, and their dates. There are currently ratification efforts in all of the unratified states. Um, in the, all indications are that the next state and the final 38th state will be the state of Virginia. And that one of the reasons for that um, is uh, because of the uh, turnover in the Virginia uh, state legislature that happened in the November election. Um, this is not a coincidence. The um, Virginia effort to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment really got a fever pitch, uh, reached a fever pitch last spring. And um, ultimately, it was the leadership of a committee that refused to allow the bill out of committee to the full floor to vote, where it probably had the votes to pass. Um, but the leadership wouldn't let it out. And there was actually a procedural vote within that committee to advance the bill to the floor. Um, uh, and that a procedural vote failed by one vote. And at that point, the um, activists in Virginia turned their attention to the November election and uh, made it uh, really an election about equality. Um, and were very successful, I think, in uh, in in creating um, buzz and helping the um, you know the folks who were looking to turn uh, the state red to blue and ultimately succeeded in that in November. Um, the advocates for the Equal Rights Amendment in Virginia have promised that uh, the Equal Rights Amendment will be one of the very first things that the new legislature in Virginia accomplishes, um, and it could come as early as the middle of January. Um, that Virginia would become the 38th state. And we're going to talk uh, a little bit about, in a moment, about what that means, um, because there are some unfinished issues, unresolved issues. For example, what is the impact of the uh, deadline that expired in 1982? And um, a number of the states, I don't have them pictured on this slide, but a number of, this, of the states, a total of five, who did ratify in the 1970s, um, later made some effort to either take back a prior ratification or limit it in some way. And so um, we'll have to deal with the question of what do we do about what we call those rescinded states. Um, and so are we really talking about 35 or are we really only at 32, 33? Um, and so we'll, we'll get to those issues uh, in a moment. But I think if you can advance the slide, I think we, we can turn now to um, the consequences of the Equal Rights Amendment and a little bit of a discussion of why we need it. And for that, I'm gonna turn the mic back to Jessica. Thank you. Yeah, just a couple of historical notes before I get to that um, for people who, uh, you know, I, I think um, Linda mentioned that uh, this new three state idea came up. Um, where that came from was for many, many years, the ERA had been introduced, reintroduced as a kind of what they call now a start over, uh, which would have had to go through the entire process. And then in, uh, I think it was just around the year 2000, um, the Madison Amendment suddenly came into view and the Madison Amendment had been written by James Madison and it had never really finished the ratification process until I think it was a graduate student as an experiment just decided to try to finish ratifying that amendment. It only provides that a pay rise for elected officials can't go into effect before an intervening election. Um, and it just never finished the process. And 203 years later, after it was uh, first passed by Congress, that amendment was uh, ratified by the last state and went into the Constitution. So I think that gave activists for the ERA the idea, even though there was, was obviously no deadline in the Madison Amendment, that maybe we could just pick up where we left off. And that led to Nevada. And another just a little point about Nevada that's quite similar to what happened in Virginia is Pat Spearman 
started her effort in 2016, couldn't get it through intervening election where the ERA became an issue and they flipped the legislature. Uh, and, and then in 2017, that was one of the top orders of business for them, which inspired Illinois and, uh, and um, Virginia, both of which states had been trying for years in one house or another, passing the ratification, but not both houses at any time until after Nevada. So, um, so that's just a little bit more history, but on to uh, why we need the ERA. And when I first started this coalition, which was about five years ago, it was the number one question that I got from people. I noticed we did a poll and documented uh, that 80% of Americans thought we already had the ERA. But the other thing I noticed is most people just didn't know why we needed it. And I think partly that was just they thought it had been ratified or many people maybe thought, well, we have the 14th Amendment Equal Protection of the Laws that have completed that. Um, and if you uh, go to the next slide, you have the text of the 14th Amendment and it does say, of course, equal protection of the laws, which sounds pretty good in theory, but remember that that's the 14th Amendment and it took us 50 more years in the 19th Amendment to just get women the right to vote. So the 14th Amendment was drafted to deal with racial discrimination and had never been applied to women's rights until the 1970s and the women's movement, where cases started to be brought by people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg and really stretched the 14th Amendment uh, to cover some of these uh, forms of sex discrimination. But the 14th Amendment is not sufficient. And I think at some gut level, we all know we don't have equality. You know, it's debatable how fast we're moving towards equality and how much of a role the law is playing. But uh, so many people ask me these questions that I did a book trying to highlight. It's called Equal Means Equal Why the Time for an Equal Rights Amendment is Now. And it highlights cases of women in various areas of law that have gone all the way up to the Supreme Court and not been able to get justice uh, for various forms of discrimination. Um, so why is the 14th Amendment uh, not enough? Well, maybe just head to the next slide and we can look at some of these other provisions. Uh, the 14th Amendment, um, actually, as I'm sure many of you know, is limited to state action. And so a lot of the protections that we think of, like Title VII, Title IX, are really not uh, uh, covered under the 14th Amendment. They find jurisdiction under the Commerce Clause. And the Commerce Clause has been stretched extensively to um, include some of these types of laws, but the Supreme Court did say quite definitively that stretching stops at violence against women. And there are a series of cases related to violence against women, starting with a Supreme Court case called U.S. versus Morrison, that um, threw out the provision of the 1994 Violence Against Women Act that had allowed victims of gender-based violence to take their cases to federal court. And a woman called Christy Brancala, who was a victim of campus sexual assault, almost identical case to what you see every day now um, in this current epidemic that um, the far, uh, freshman who was raped by varsity football players and wasn't able to get justice brought her case under this new law. It went up to the Supreme Court. They threw it out. They said, yes, this is gender-based violence, but there is not any, um, uh, any basis uh, for that provision of federal law uh, in the Constitution, which, of course, the Equal Rights Amendment would have been um, so there's a whole history of subsequent cases, too, where various creative lawyers have tried to use the 14th Amendment to, and, and the Commerce Clause to cover violence against women unsuccessfully. That's, I think, the most dramatic area. But there are many other reasons we need the ERA. There are all of these laws, and they all have loopholes, or they've been interpreted in ways that prevent women from getting justice. I mean, one obvious thing that you may know about um, Title VII, for example, it only applies to companies that have a, a minimum number of employees. So um, small businesses, less than 15 employees, no coverage there. Uh, Title IX only applies to schools that get federal funding. So if a school doesn't get federal funding, it's not covered by Title IX. And the list goes on. Um, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act uh, was passed because the Supreme Court didn't think pregnancy discrimination was a form of sex discrimination. So we have a series of loopholes and interpretations that have really narrowed the path for, for justice for women. And um, and the ERA would, would change that. And, and one other point, uh, maybe just to go to the next slide. 
uh, is intermediate scrutiny. Um, there were a series of cases in the 70s um, and the standard of scrutiny that was used for race discrimination in, in, in cases under the 14th Amendment is strict scrutiny. And what we have now, uh, which was a Supreme Court compromise, is intermediate level scrutiny. So it's a lesser standard. Cases of sex discrimination, ironically, are being reviewed by the Supreme Court with a discriminatory standard that uh, is lower and results in, in less uh, success for people who bring cases. Um, so it has to be an important governmental interest and a law substantially related rather than the much higher bar of a compelling government interest and a, a law that's necessary um, for that interest. Um, so uh, there are all of these different ways in which the law continues to discriminate against women. The ERA, I think in a big picture sense, would do two things. One, it would provide an opportunity for more practical remedies uh, legally for women uh, who are seeking recourse for various forms of discrimination, including violence. It would give Congress the authority to pass statutes that it doesn't have already have with regard to gender-based violence. And it would be a whole new bite at the apple and many other ways uh, for lawyers who are trying to use these legal standards to protect women and promote women's equality. Um, and then there's the other level, which is more the level of principle in the age of Me Too, I think, and other cultural movements that really goes back and fixes the Constitution to say in a public way as a form of messaging that women, you know, at the highest level of law are no longer going to be treated as second class citizens. And I think that has a tremendous value that will impact, but is even greater than uh, the law and the way the law is interpreted. Um, so I think um, those are just a few of the reasons. I'd be glad to go into more cases, but in the interest of time, maybe I should just stop there. So one of the uh, one of the things I think is important about the um, about the Fourteenth Amendment cases, and if you could go to the next slide, um, if, if you've seen the the RBG movie or movies, um, you know that a significant part of her work before she joined the bench was to argue for. Uh, for a, the development of a body of cases in the Supreme Court that recognize um, discrimination on the basis of sex as something that mm -hmm. is prohibited by the 14th Amendment. Obviously, the 14th Amendment doesn't talk about sex. It doesn't use the word sex. And um, she was successful up to a point. And as Jessica noted, um, the Supreme Court has held that the 14th Amendment provides some protection against discrimination on the basis of sex, but not as much protection as it does for discrimination on the basis of race and national origin. Um, and so what you see on this slide is just an illustration of the different levels of scrutiny in the current Supreme Court cases. Strict scrutiny applies to uh, uh, allegations of race discrimination. So if there is a um, law that uh, uses a racial uh, criteria, um, that law or practice will receive strict scrutiny. Intermediate scrutiny is for gender and or sex. And, um, and then rational basis is for other kinds of uh, groups or, or types of discrimination um, that have not been recognized under the Supreme Court's cases as being uh, protected classes. Um, now, I, I will say that this is a pretty esoteric thing, and if the case for the Equal Rights Amendment depended on people understanding the difference between intermediate scrutiny and strict scrutiny, we would all be lost. Um, because this is a distinction I, many of you probably remember from law school as being very esoteric. There are some cases where it would make a difference, and the way I like to think about it is that intermediate scrutiny um, if you're if you're under intermediate scrutiny, it doesn't matter if there was a less discriminatory way to do it. So strict scrutiny says it, it has to be narrowly tailored to achieve a particular compelling state interest, and it has to really be the only way to do it. Um, and, and so it, it, for intermediate scrutiny, if a legislature has two different ways to solve the same problem, one of them discriminates on the basis of sex and one of them doesn't, it can choose the one that discriminates on the basis of sex. So we can all kind of imagine cases that might turn on that distinction. I think the bigger problem, though, is that um, the recognition of discrimination on the basis of sex under the 14th Amendment is something that's in question. Um, 
it was not, those were not unanimous cases. Um, Justice Scalia uh, was famously quoted once as saying, it's not, the question isn't whether the Constitution requires discrimination on the basis of sex, it doesn't. The question is whether it prohibits it, and it doesn't do that either. And on some level, he's right, historically, right? Because the, when, there's no question that when the 14th Amendment was ratified, um, it happened at a time when women didn't even have the right to vote. And so I think it's probably fair to say that the people who were voting on the 14th Amendment did not think at that time that they were eliminating sex discrimination under the law. Um, there's no reason to think they, they did think that. Um, and in fact, um, they didn't say that. And so if you approach the Constitution the way someone like Scalia approaches the Constitution, you're inclined to hold that the 14th Amendment offers no protection against discrimination on the basis of sex. And we have a president who has promised more justices in the mold of Justice Scalia. So um, that's another way in which um, the uh, having a separate explicit amendment that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex is really consistent with the way that Justice Scalia looks at the Constitution and is something that, you know, I, I have heard people who are who subscribe to his view of the Constitution as saying, well, at least you're doing it the right way um, if you're trying to actually amend the Constitution to add discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, if you look at the next slide, um, it illustrates, I think, another way in which the ERA is really important. And this is something that, um, if you could advance the slide, please. Uh, this is something that uh, Jessica mentioned a moment ago, and that's the power of Congress. Um, uh, there we, oops, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the wrong screen. Um, if you look at the se Section 2 of the Equal Rights Amendment in front of you, it says that Congress, shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. That, just, that section of the ERA doesn't get a lot of attention, but it's incredibly important. And this is what Jessica was talking about a moment ago in terms of giving Congress additional power. Um, one example of this is um, there was a law that was enacted uh, a number of years ago that makes, it's a federal law that criminalizes uh, female genital mutilation. And a federal judge in Michigan recently struck that law down on the ground that it was beyond the power of commerce under of, of Congress under the Commerce Clause. Now, as we all know, and as Jessica mentioned, the Commerce Clause has been stretched pretty far. Um, but this judge concluded that the Commerce Clause couldn't go that far, and that there was no nexus to interstate commerce when you prohibited female genital mutilation at a federal level. Um, you know, the, the, second amend, the second clause of the Equal Rights Amendment could provide Congress with an alternative source of power. And um, in violence, law enforcement, and those kinds of activities where the nexus with interstate commerce isn't very clear, um, those kinds of protections uh, could be very important um, in terms of, uh, of ensuring um, protection against even very invidious forms of discrimination or just violence um, on the basis of sex. Um, so if we'll proceed now to talk about a couple of the ratification issues that are um, out there and are going to have to be uh, resolved in some fashion. And, and we can talk about how that might happen. And the first one is uh, the deadline. Um, we've mentioned the deadline. It was a seven-year deadline um, that was created by Congress in 1972. Um, and if you look at the actual text of the deadline, if you move ahead one slide, um, uh, there it is. This, oh, no, sorry, go back. I was looking at the wrong thing again. If you go back to the prior slide, you see the, the text of the joint resolution itself that passed in 1972. So you see it. it in that first main central paragraph, it says, resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives, and then skipping ahead, that the following article is proposed, and it shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of the Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states within seven years from the date of its submission by the Congress. So that's the deadline. And this concept of the deadline was actually fairly uh, 
it was it it was not part of our history until the 20th century. Um, the first amendment to be uh, given a deadline was uh, the um, prohibition amendment, and then suffrage was next, and it did not have a deadline. And then every deadline after um, uh, women's suffrage that has been proposed by Congress did include some form of deadline. Some of the deadlines appeared in the joint resolution, which is what happened with the Equal Rights Amendment and which you see on the screen in front of you. Some of the deadlines were actually built into the language of the amendment itself. So for example, if you look at section three of the Equal Rights Amendment on the screen, it says this amendment shall take effect two years after the date of ratification. And a lot of amendments say that kind of thing. It says, you know, it basically is giving the states an opportunity to get their act together after the thing becomes part of the Constitution. But it was not unusual in the amendments proposed in the 20th century to have a section like that that said this amendment shall be valid for all intents and purposes if ratified within seven years of when proposed by Congress. Um, there's... Now, the process for ratifying the Constitution is set forth in Article 5, and it doesn't talk about time limits or deadlines or anything like that. It just says that an amendment is effective as soon as it's ratified by three-quarters of the state. Um, so you might ask, how, how can Congress change that? And, and there are arguments that Congress really can't change that. Now, there is a Supreme Court case on this topic on um, when the Prohibition Amendment was first enforced, somebody who was caught basically alcohol running or moonshining or something um, was arrested and he challenged um, <clears throat> the prohibition amendment on the ground that it contained a deadline. He said the inclusion of a deadline made the amendment invalid. And the Supreme Court said, no, no, it doesn't make it invalid. Congress has broad power to propose what it wants in terms of amendments. And in this instance, it proposed an amendment that included a seven-year deadline. And so Congress has the power to do that. So, you know, that does suggest that Congress does have the power to talk about time limits and reflect on what a reasonable amount of time would be. And in fact, there's, there's a later case that uh, Coleman v. Miller that talks about Congress having quite broad power um, in respect to deadlines, so much so that um, a case uh, that relates to the process for ratification isn't even reviewable in the courts. Um, so that a um, someone who so, so that uh, if Congress imposed a deadline or we think took away a deadline, um, a challenge to that lawsuit wouldn't be judicially reviewable. What has never been tested by the courts is whether a deadline imposed by Congress is, could ever be effective to stop an amendment from becoming part of the Constitution. So that the cases that were before the Supreme Court didn't really concern that question. There's never been a situation in our history where a deadline made a difference. And the ERA, you know, some people will argue that the ERA is the first amendment where that is the case. And so it's an unresolved question in the courts whether a deadline could ever really stand in the way of effectiveness if you really have 38 states who ratified. But there's a simpler answer to this question. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that the deadline, because it was included in the uh, joint resolution, it was not in the body of the amendment, the deadline could be removed. And that's because we know in our system that one Congress cannot bind a future Congress. The deadline for the Equal Rights Amendment was contained just in that introductory paragraph. It isn't part of the language that all the states voted on. So since it's just in that little joint resolution by Congress, a subsequent Congress should be able to change it. And that's in fact what happened in 1978 when a simple majority of Congress voted to extend the deadline by three years. So there is now a bill pending in Congress to remove the deadline, to remove that language from the 1972 Joint Resolution and make the Equal Rights Amendment uh, valid and for all intents and purposes as soon as the 38th state ratified. Um, what you're seeing on the screen here is the text of uh, H.J. Res. 79, 
which is the House version of the bill. It was uh, sponsored originally by Jackie Spear and now has many, many, many co-sponsors. Um, and it uh, was actually approved by the House Judiciary Committee and sent to Nancy Pelosi on November 13th of this year. So this bill is now pending and uh, eligible to be voted on by the full House, and we hope that that will happen uh, relatively soon. Um, and uh, there is a companion bill that is pending in the Senate, Um, It has not been, it's still in the Judiciary Committee. It hasn't been subject to a hearing there. At this point, there was a House Judiciary Committee hearing on this bill uh, last spring. It's very interesting. If you're interested in looking at it, you can see the the, uh, recording on um, the Internet. Um, There has not yet been a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, um, but uh, we hope that that will occur. And then the question is what the Senate will do with it. Um, the, the Senate resolution does have bipartisan sponsorship currently. It's uh, co-sponsored by Senators Cardin and Murkowski. And there are a number of other, uh, they, there are now more and more uh, co-sponsors. Originally, Senator Cardin was adding Democratic sponsors only when he could find Republican co-sponsors. Um, and not that many raised their hand. So uh, now uh, additional Democratic co-sponsors are being added. Um, And the hope is that this resolution will go to the full Senate Um, uh, because if the if the deadline is simply removed, that should reduce or eliminate the question about um, whether the timetable is simply uh, too long. So the the other question um, uh, relating to ratification has to do with rescissions. Um, I mentioned earlier that there were five states that tried to limit or rescind uh, their prior resolution and, uh, that uh, ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. And so the question becomes, is that a thing? Can, can you take back a ratification? And there's pretty good, I think, legal argument and historical precedent for the conclusion that you can't take back a resolution or take back a, a, a ratification. Um, The legal argument is that if you look at the text of Article 5, which is on the screen, it says that an amendment uh, shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of the Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states of the several states. The ratification is the type of thing that happens at a point in time. And the question for purposes of the effectiveness of the amendment is simply, did 38 states ratify at some point in time? There's nothing in Article 5 that requires them all to ratify at the same time or that allows them to reaffirm or requires them to reaffirm a ratification or that empowers them to retract a ratification. The question is simply, did they vote to ratify? And the answer for those five states is yes, they did vote to ratify. And uh, so their ratifications should count and there's nothing they can do to take them back. Um, The historical precedent for this is actually in the 14th Amendment. Um, When the 14th Amendment became part of our Constitution, two of the states needed to reach the three-quarters threshold had attempted to rescind a prior ratification. And yet all three branches of government treated the 14th Amendment as fully ratified and part of our Constitution. Um, In fact, although they didn't really need to, um, there was a statement by Congress affirming their conclusion that um, uh, that the amendment had been fully ratified. And the administrative branch, which at that time that was the relevant person was the Secretary of State, declared the uh, amendment to be effective. Um, so that's a pretty good historical precedent um, for the idea that uh, a rescission uh, can't be taken back. So um, those are two sets of legal issues that have been getting a lot of attention. It's been really interesting recently to hear what the opposition is to the uh, Equal Rights Amendment. And um, I was, I thought it was very curious that at the hearing in the House of Representatives Judiciary Committee to mark up the bill, the opposition was framed in terms of the deadline. So the speaker, the, the first speaker who opposed the Equal Rights Amendment after Jerry Nadler spoke, 
said, of course, equality is a great thing. Of course, everybody thinks equality is terrific and, and should be recognized, but not this way, because this amendment is dead. This amendment um, has expired, and there's nothing anybody can do to resuscitate it. I thought that was a really interesting and um, promising development that even someone who opposes the Equal Rights Amendment recognizes that it's politically costly for him to come forward and actually oppose it on its merits, um, uh, to actually say that we shouldn't have an Equal Rights Amendment in the, our Constitution. Instead, he found himself or placed himself uh, behind uh, the deadline as really the rationale for opposition. And, um, and that's why I think it's so important that, uh, that the Congress does go ahead and remove the deadline. Um, it just would eliminate that argument um, that the time for uh, changing the Constitution in this way has simply passed and an effort would have to start anew in order to get uh, the Equal Rights Amendment into the Constitution. So um, we have one additional slide, and it's, it's a reference to some resources for you. Um, obviously, we're, we're referring you to the ERA Coalition's website. And then uh, my firm's website has an Equal Rights Amendment page that collects uh, resources as well. There are many other resources out there. Um, Equality Now does a lot of work on this topic. The National Organization for Women does a lot of work on this topic. Uh, the National Women's Law Center does some. So there's a lot of different organizations that look at this issue. Um, these are just two resources, obviously the ones that we represent, um, that um, can provide you some additional resources. And um, we are delighted to take questions if that is feasible on the system. Karen, is that feasible? It is. People can go ahead and type questions into the chat box um, on their screen and we can see them. Um, I do have a question though that can get us started while people are uh, busy typing away before they hit send. Um, what's the best way an individual can get involved to support the ERA ratification. So not as a representative of their, their firm or their organization, but you know, as an individual, what do you think the best thing they can do is to contribute? Uh, I can try to take that if you like um, for a first step. I, it's Jessica, I think uh, there, there are basically two top of the list things that, that I would suggest. One is contact their members of Congress, their senator, uh, their senators and their representative, and with regard to the House, urge them to proceed with a full vote on the removal of the deadline. And with regard to the Senate, basically it's the same thing, even though they're further behind. But uh, urge them to see if they've uh, signed on to the to the bill, and if not, urge them to support that bill to remove the deadline. Um, the other really big sort of bucket of uh, work that needs to be done is, is educational. I think when we started, we just felt there's an enormous information gap. Most people think we already have this Equal Rights Amendment in the Constitution. People don't understand why uh, we need it. And of course, lawyers are so well placed to help explain all of that. And we need to get the word out. Uh, we've had some help from people like John Oliver who reached lots of people. But I think that is a really high priority is to just make people aware of it. Because what I find, especially with younger generations of women and even uh, men, actually, when they find out we don't have it uh, and that we kind of need it, there's a certain outrage that just kicks in. And that's a lot of energy that we need for this campaign. Uh, but most people don't know that at this point. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I just got another question via email. And Linda, I think you spoke to this a little bit um, when talking about um, the markup and the objections you were hearing. But um, do you anticipate another Phyllis Shafley? Well, actually, she has a child. She literally <laughs> has a child um, who is uh, who is uh, an opponent and now runs an organization called the, the uh, Eagle Forum, which opposes the Equal Rights Amendment. 
Um, and so th- there is some of that. And there are, there are a few people. It's a very small population, though. It's really different than what uh, happened in Phil Schlafly's day. And I think one of the reasons is that the arguments are actually many of the same arguments, and they just don't work in 2019. Um, for example, uh, and I, I did a, a, I guess it turned out into a debate with uh, a, a woman who opposes uh, the Equal Rights Amendment on the National Constitution Center's um, a podcast series, and it's an interesting conversation. If, you, if you're interested in seeing what some of the opposition is and what the answers are to the opposition, you might look that podcast up. Um, but one of the things um, she said was, uh, well, if we had an Equal Rights Amendment, it would become impossible to have an all-male draft. To which I say, yeah, exactly. And because it's 2019, and Women serve in all aspects of our military, in combat, in every role, with tremendous distinction. And I care more about, and I think we should all care more, about the equality and equal opportunity of the women who volunteer to serve in the military than we should about um, preserving this idea of an all-male draft, which seems completely incongruous uh, with the way our society works today. Um, in fact, there's actually a federal judge in Texas uh, recently who held that the all-male selective service violates the 14th Amendment um, uh, because it just can't be justified. And the Pentagon and John McCain and, and many people um, in the military world have long recommended that uh, the draft be made uh, both male and female and um, because it just is the right thing to do. So that's one opposition. Uh, another is um, uh, that the Equal Rights Amendment will make it difficult, more difficult for there to be laws that protect women. Um, and some of the examples uh, that Phyllis Schlafly used back in the day were the state laws that defaulted to the mom in a custody case and the state laws that provided for alimony um, uh, payment to a wife from a husband after a divorce. And the, the problem with that is most of those laws have already been eliminated because they were antiquated. And um, so now instead of looking to gender to resolve the um, custody questions, we actually look at best interest of the child, which is a much better thing anyway. Um, and, and similarly, uh, alimony is now framed in terms of the spouse who makes more money, which also seems appropriate. So a lot of the things of the types of laws that Phyllis Schlafly wanted to protect and keep in place have already been eliminated because they just don't make any sense anymore. Um, so, so those are some of the arguments. Some of the other arguments actually are about um, if, if we had an equal rights amendment, we would get, we would have to have gay marriage. Well, we have to, you know, we now have a constitutionally recognized right to same-sex marriage that happened without any reference to an Equal Rights Amendment. Um, you know, if we had, you know, if we had uh, uh, an Equal Rights Amendment, we wouldn't be able to have single-sex bathrooms in state buildings. You know, we now know, after all these years, that many, many states have state Equal Rights Amendments and yet they still have single-sex bathrooms in state buildings. Um, I hope actually they have, they also have at least one unisex bathroom, but they, they at least do maintain single-sex bathrooms in, in state buildings. So a, a lot of the kind of parade of horribles that Phyllis Schlafly trumpeted and that you hear echoed today by some, by this, I think, very, very small minority group um, are things that just don't, they're objections that just don't make sense under, in our contemporary environment. Thanks, Linda. It looks like I have another question that came in. Um, our, you guys are great sending these questions in. Um, I'm going to just try and summarize it. Uh, something we didn't talk about today was um, the anti-choice movement opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment. I know that's probably opening a huge can of worms. Um, 
but um, you know, maybe your your top line defense against the um, anti-choice movement's opposition to the ERA. Well, I'll say a couple things about that, and then Jessica, if you want to add anything, um, just like with what I said a moment ago about same-sex marriage, we already have a constitutionally recognized uh, right uh, in terms of access to abortion, and that was recognized without any reference to an, an Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and so that already exists, it exists today. Um, the, I have not heard anyone articulate why an Equal Rights Amendment would strike down a, an, abortion res, uh, an abortion restriction that would survive under current law. Um, and so there's a lot of fear mongering around this issue. I mean, there was somebody, one legislator at the um, House Judiciary Committee hearing said, if the Equal Rights Amendment is passed, every single abortion restriction in all 50 states would be immediately invalidated and we would have abortion on demand for all nine months. And I think that's just fear mongering. There's no reason to believe that that is true. There are limits and case law that develops under every single uh, provision of the Constitution. So I think it's it's an exaggerated concern um, and uh, one that requires a lot of hypothesizing about departures from current law. Jessica, anything you want to add on that? No, I mean, I think the only thing I would add is I, I just think it's a smokescreen. I think it's a red herring. I, I think that... Um, this, as Linda said, is a battle. This is another battleground. This is a Roe v. Wade under a privacy right under the Constitution. Um, and there, I don't think there's any reason to think, actually, that it will come out differently. It's really, if the Supreme Court is going to uphold or not uphold Roe v. Wade, I can't imagine they would come out differently than that on the ERA. mention abortion by, by, by name in any place. And, you know, arguments can be made both ways and have been. Um, and by and large, the ERA, you know, have, which I can personally might consider unfortunate, but by and large, the ERA has not uh, been uh, helpful in most of the, or almost all of the states where, where there is one, not to mention all the countries around the world. And, and that's one other point I would just jump in to make is most countries around the world that have constitutions have equality provisions that uh, include ERA type of language. And um, it's just interesting to note that the United States strongly supported these equality provisions and in the case of Iraq and Afghanistan really virtually strong armed those governments into putting that provision in their constitution. So it's a little bit odd that we don't have it in ours. And um, I really think it's a nonpartisan, bipartisan issue and always has been, it's a fundamental human right. And, and I think throwing abortion into the mix is really disingenuous. Uh, that's not, I don't think that's really why we need the ERA. Um, well, I think that's a, a lovely way for us to end. Um, on behalf of the National Association of Women Lawyers, I just really want to thank Jessica and Linda for giving us their time today. I hope everyone who joined it found um, this presentation as informative and um, inspiring to action as I did. I, uh, I already have three emails opened and started to my senators and representative, and I hope um, everyone who joined today does as well. Um, oh, that's fantastic, Karen. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. I'm, uh, you've inspired me. So uh, Jan Schakowsky, look out. Uh, <laughs> Uh, though she's already a supporter. So um, thank you all uh, for, for joining. And again, thank you, Jessica and Linda, for um, sharing your time today. Thank you. Great to be with you.